right now. Okay, great. So Ryan McBain is a health policy researcher at the RAND Corporation and director of economic evaluation at Partners in Health. He has particular interest in the design and evaluation of health policies and programs meant to reach vulnerable populations, including those coping with mental health conditions, HIV and AIDS, homelessness, and poverty. To achieve this, Dr. McBain has utilized a wide range of methodologies, including econometric approaches to quasi-experimental analysis, cost effectiveness, and decision analysis using Markovian and Monte Carlo methods, as well as person-centered and qualitative research methodologies. Dr. McBain's domestic work has focused on evaluating policies and programs intended to expand access and quality of care to individuals with opioid dependence in rural Appalachia, HIV positive individuals coping with homelessness and housing insecurity, and veterans who are dealing with PTSD. Internationally, Dr. McBain has worked at the World Bank, World Health Organization, and Harvard University. In his current role with Partners in Health, his focus is on evaluating mental health, HIV, and primary care service delivery systems, primarily in Sub-Saharan Africa and Haiti. Dr. McBain holds a doctoral and master's degree in global health with concentrations in health economics and health policy analysis from the Harvard School of Public Health, as well as a BA in psychology from Gordon College and Oxford University in the United Kingdom. So Ryan, we'll give you the floor. Great. Um, <clears throat> so can, is my, uh, my screen is shared now? Yes, looks great. Excellent. Awesome. Okay. Um, thanks for the, the introduction uh, and hello for, for those on the line and joining um, in the classroom. Sorry that the video feed of me isn't working. Um, but just the same, I thought that I would start by um, quickly touching on RAND and Partners in Health, the two places that I work at as a way to sort of set the table for the broader lecture. So RAND is a, a think tank of sorts. And so you can think of a think tank as sort of situated between a research university and a consulting firm like McKinsey or something of the sort with a focus on shaping policies uh, in the United States and abroad. And so in my role at RAND, I'm doing a lot of health economic and policy research on programs and then legislation that's meant to help vulnerable populations like those that were just mentioned. Um, and then at Partners in Health, Partners in Health does a lot of service delivery. So they're trying to provide healthcare to vulnerable populations around the world in countries like Sierra Leone, Lesotho, Haiti, et cetera. And in my role there running a division of economic evaluation, a lot of it actually has to do with fundraising. So every year Partners in Health needs to raise $150 million and to do that, we need to make a strong case to potential donors that their contributions are gonna be a good investment that's gonna have a high impact. And so putting those together, you could think of me as sort of a health economist who's really only interested in academic research insofar as it's advocating for policies to help impact people who have um, high needs, I guess you could say. So I spend a lot of less time on the theoretical and a lot more of the applied. And so that's gonna have a bearing on what we're focusing on today, which is not just economic analysis in the abstract, but specifically with respect to program evaluation. All right, so with that said, um, let's start talking a little bit about economic analysis. I mean, economic analysis spans a wide range of disciplines, right? So, I mean, there's like micro, macro economics, econometrics, accounting, finance, uh, et cetera. Um, fortunately for, for those of you today, I'm gonna to teach you all of that in 60 minutes. Um, not, that's not quite the case. What I'm actually hoping to do is to try to lay some of the groundwork and intuitions that motivates a lot of economic analysis for program evaluation, right? So you could say it's highly superficial, but I'm hoping that it piques enough of your interest that you're like, hey, maybe this actually is of relevance to me in certain ways. And so to start, I wanted to point out the image that you can see in the background of this slide. Some of you might recognize it. So what's in the background there is a charging bowl, which is a statue in the financial district of New York. Um, it's, it's pretty massive. It's like 7,000 pounds. And it's a symbol of sort of the aggressive financial optimism and prosperity of Wall Street. And then in the foreground is a fearless girl, which is a more recent statue that was 
erected in 2017 that was meant to send a message about gender diversity, uh, particularly in the financial industries. And it's actually a really, uh, it's an irony of sorts because State Street Global Advisors, which paid to erect a fearless girl, right after it was constructed was sued for gender discrimination in their own hiring and pay practices. Um, so I wanted to, to flag that for a couple reasons. So one, money matters a lot, right? Um, it, it begets power and has a lot of influence, but the people who have it don't always use it for good. Sometimes they use it for whitewashing their own image, for example. Um, and so I wanted to point that out because it, it relates to the fact that we all have an impetus for relating whatever outcomes we care about, whether it's health or education or whatever, to economics, uh, because economics ultimately shapes the world whether or not we want it to be the case. You know, case in point is that most countries where I've worked, <clears throat> which at this point is quite a few, you find that ministers of health ultimately report up to ministers of finance. So at a minimum, the finance minister is going to set the budget for different departments, including the health department. And so if you have a program or policy you're really interested in, you're going to have to beat out education, labor, agriculture, you name it to get a bigger slice of the pie for your pet project. And so at the end of the, of the day, there's a lot of jockeying analyses, but from whatever else, you know, you take away from what I'm talking about today, it's that uh, economics actually is, is going to matter and influence a lot of decisions. So moving on to the next slide here. Let's see, here we go. So I wanted to contrast effectiveness with efficiency and then talk about um, sort of the principle of utilitarianism, which underpins most economic analysis. So, you know, effectiveness put simply is just whether something works, right? So does the intervention you care about have potency? Uh, you know, is there an effect? Efficiency takes effectiveness and it looks at relative to resources. So it looks at effectiveness relative to time, money, human resources, people, et cetera. And at the end of the day, that's what sort of economic analysis cares the most about is efficiency. And so to highlight that in a concrete way, I wanted to give uh, an example. So uh, R01 grants are a really uh, important part of academia in the United States. You know, it's what professors like Teresa is striving for. You know, essentially you pitch a research idea to the National Institutes of Health. If they like your idea, they give you a boatload of money for five years. And so let's talk about Teresa for a minute. Let's say that she, she gets a big check from the NIH to implement an intervention in Sierra Leone, Rwanda, or somewhere else to help kids who have depression and anxiety. You know, what is Teresa's biggest priority in the NIH context? The answer is, she wants to show that her intervention is effective. If it isn't effective, she's not gonna get good p-values. If she doesn't get good b-values, she's not gonna be able to publish them in sexy journals. If she doesn't publish them in sexy journals, she's not gonna get the next grant and then she's gonna be out of a job. So she needs to make sure that what she's doing is effective. Um, but how do you guarantee that what you're doing is effective, that an intervention is going to come up positive? Well, there are a few ways that you can gain the system to do that. So one is that if you're Teresa, you're gonna hire the best psychologists <laughs> in all of Sierra Leone, right? Because they're the ones who are gonna give you the sort of biggest effect that you're looking for. And they're probably gonna cost quite a bit of money if they're very well trained. The next is you're gonna train them a lot on the intervention. You're gonna spend a lot of time and money on the intervention itself. And then you're gonna want a huge sample size. So even if your effect is really tiny, you end up with enough statistical power to find an effect. And then last, you'll, you're gonna to wanna to make sure that the intervention is happening in a really intensive way, that it takes place over a long period of time with a lot of sessions. So there's a really large sort of dose effect that you're observing. So let's say Teresa does all that. She finds a great effect. She publishes her findings in JAMA or something of the like. And now she actually wants to scale up her intervention at a national level. She wants to treat all kids with depression throughout Sierra Leone, let's say. So to do that, Teresa is gonna to have to go to the government of Sierra Leone and make her case to say, hey, this is the best way that you can spend your money. Forget about paving roads or buying bed nets or subsidizing schooling or whatever it might be. Uh, you know, I have the greatest thing. And what the government is gonna say is, 
that sounds great. How much does that cost? And then she's going to say something like, well, gee, you know, our, our grant cost $3 million. We treated 400 kids. So it's going to be like $8,000 a kid. And at that point, the conversation is over, right? So fortunately, that's not actually what Teresa did, at least not on the projects that I've worked on with her. So instead, what Teresa has done in the case of the youth readiness intervention, for example, is she's trained local experts who then trained lay health workers who weren't super expensive. She had an easy protocol for training, so it didn't take a lot of time. Everything was standardized, and so it was easy for people to follow protocol and have high fidelity. The sessions weren't super long, and there weren't too many of them. So you ended up with a similar effect, but a much lower price tag. And that starts conversations with ministries and other funders, like Teresa has been able to do to scale up some of this work. All right, so let's talk about um, utilitarianism and this creepy looking guy here in the slide. Um, so the guy who uh, sort of came up with a theory of utilitarianism is Jeremy Bentham. Uh, he was a British fellow born in the mid 1700s. Um, and so he basically came up with the idea. I have this photo here actually, because if you go to the University College in London, you can literally find Jeremy Bentham here, meaning that he has been mummified and his body is on preservation. And so this is an actual photograph of his mummified body. Um, so in any case, Bentham's basic idea was, uh, you should try to choose the course of action that maximizes total well-being for society, uh, whatever way you, de you define well-being. So in other words, oftentimes you're gonna have limited resources and you need to figure out how to allocate limited resources in a way that leads to the greatest benefit for society. And I think we can all agree that we don't wanna allocate resources in a way that minimizes well-being, you know, so, so it's a starting point. But that said, um, utilitarianism is indifferent to the individual or individual rights or equal allocation. A lot of these things that sort of come up when you talk about principles of egalitarianism. But you actually find that it's pretty hard um, not to be utilitarian in uh, certain respects. And so I wanted to flag two potential objections to utilitarianism that, that might be raised, keeping in mind that it's what underpins almost all of economic analysis. It's the idea that resources are scarce, and so we need to distribute them in a way that optimizes allocation for, you know, we, we have a limited budget, right? We only have $10 million. How are we gonna allocate this most efficiently to try to improve population health, for example? So a couple um, objections that are often raised to utilitarianism. <clears throat> so the first is, about trying to prioritize the worst off in society. And so this is sort of the Rawlianism or Maximin principle, which maybe folks have heard before. So shouldn't we somehow prioritize those who are worst off in terms of the way that we allocate our resources? And you know, does utilitarianism do this? Well, it does do it in an indirect way. So when we talk about who is the worst off in society, we often want, you know, we need to say like, well, how do we define who is worst off? You might think, for example, that, well, maybe it's people who have no money, for example. And in that context, you know, there's greater utility to give $100 to somebody who's homeless and doesn't have any money than there is to give $100 to Donald Trump, for example, who has billions of dollars, right? And so utilitarianism basically would conclude that giving $100 to somebody with no money results in greater utility than giving uh, the same amount of money to a rich person. The same is true with food or health or anything of the like, right? Like it's more important to give a slice of pizza to somebody who's really hungry because they're gonna have more utility for it than somebody who's already eaten a whole pizza beforehand. And so it kind of accounts and calibrates internally that way for prioritizing the worst off in society. The next is about protecting individual rights, which comes up when you talk about, for example, um, libertarianism. And so, you know, there might be a fear, for example, you know, could I be injured for some reason if that ends up benefiting the majority? Like you think about, for example, the United States, there's um, eminent domain, right? Like you have a house somewhere and the government comes along and is like, actually, we want you to move your house now, right? So what about individual rights if it, if it um, benefits society to violate them? Well, uh, utilitarianism, yes and no, sort of takes this into account. So 
to highlight this, I wanted to mention uh, a story, uh, which is a true story, um, about a group of sailors, uh, British sailors in the late 1800s. Um, basically, they were, they were trapped at sea for a whole bunch of days. And one of the people who were on the boat, of the four of them, was so thirsty that the person drank a bunch of seawater, got really sick, and really wasn't doing well. And so in the middle of one of the nights, um, one of the British soldiers stabbed the sixth, sixth soldier in the jugular with a pen knife, killed him, and then all the rest of the people, the other three people on the boat, ate that person's body. And because they ate the person who was sick, the other three people ended up surviving until um, British, other British soldiers ended up finding them on, on a different vessel. And so from a utilitarianism perspective, you could see, you could um, potentially on a superficial level think that, well, that's actually utilitarianism practice, right? Either they're all gonna die of starvation or one of them gets killed and the rest of them benefit from, from that. And there are different, you know, less extreme examples of the way that this plays out. So the question would be, you know, did the soldiers act in a just way if they killed that person because they were, you know, maximizing outcomes with the limited resources that they had? You know, I think if the universe only existed of those four people, then utilitarianism might actually, in a way, support their actions. But the world in reality is much bigger than that, right? And what ended up happening was those British soldiers went to jail uh, for the rest of their lives. And it was based on the logic that, you know, if in Britain any soldier could be murdered without the consent of um, the rest of society, then, you know, folks would be looking over their shoulders all the time, right? All hell would break loose. And so, you know, killing innocent people without their consent generates enough disutility within society that it actually fails the utilitarianism test, right? So society as a whole loses utility if they have to constantly be walking around looking over their shoulder. And so it does sort of play out in that effect. But you know, we're going to come back to utilitarianism later, but for now, the important thing is to realize that almost all of economic analysis, which happens all the time every day, right, is looking at allocative efficiency. And because what, when we say efficiency, what we, what that's really code for is allocating resources in a way that maximizes health outcomes or whatever else, um, it, it sort of discounts other frameworks of thinking about the way that justice plays out in there are a couple of books that I might mention that would be really interesting along these lines for folks to read if they're interested in more of this theory. But you know, that said, I think that that sort of underlines some of the groundwork for, for talking about costs analysis and other forms of, of economic evaluation. So let's actually turn to um, talking about different forms of economic analysis here. So you know, my goal in the time that we have today is to try to demystify uh, what economic analysis is. And if I've done my homework right, you're going to leave um, today thinking that you might want to do this at some point in the future. And to start, I want to I talk about cost analysis because cost analysis is the inputs for any type of economic analysis, right? If you don't know what your costs are, then you can't do cost effectiveness analysis, cost utility analysis, cost benefit analysis. You don't know what your return on investment is. You can't talk about value for money if you don't know what the money is. So let's start with just basic cost analysis. So <clears throat> this is gonna be the most boring slide, just so people can prepare themselves. Um, so cost analysis is pretty much what you would expect, right? It's figuring out how much something costs over, typically over a period of time. So it could be a program or a policy. Um, it's not hard to do. I mean, it's, it's not complicated but it is super boring and tedious, right? It's one of the most mundane things that I have to do as part of my job a lot of the time. Um, and the first step that goes into it is figuring out, you know, what are the resources that are allocated to whatever program you're studying? And they often, about 95% of it falls into these buckets that I have here represented in uh, the overlapping circle. So you're talking about staff, human resources, space, like what, what rooms are you using, the stuff that goes into it, so consumables like drugs or equipment or whatever else, and then systems like IT systems, communication systems, et cetera. I'm only gonna talk about two of the buckets because it could take a long, I could spend the whole time talking about all four, but I just want you to get a sense of like the monotony of going into it, but some of the complexities that, that are required. So, so 
if we just take the staff bucket to start with, that could be a useful starting point. So staff can be tricky for a couple of reasons. And when you're trying to figure out, you know, how much staff, you know, money is being allocated to a program to come up with our costs, say, you know, cost of providing care per person, for example. So the first part is that, you know, oftentimes staff don't just spend their time on one project, they're spending their time on a bunch of projects. And then in addition to that, if you're doing a sort of research project, you need to figure out how much of somebody's time is spent on actual clinical care that you care about and how much of it is doing research related activities that really shouldn't be counted as part of those costs. And in these instances, it's important to try to identify several individuals in each role that you care about. So these might be, for example, you know, occupational therapists or physicians or whomever else that's doing clinical activities. And you'll need to know how many hours do they work over a period of time, like a week, and then what percentage of their time is being allocated to different clinical activities. So you could do one broad question, say, you know, ask, you know, a small subset of people, gee, what percent of your time is on clinical activities for this program? And then they could say, well, you know, like 20%, some sort of ballpark, or you could microcost it and hand somebody a sheet and say, here's a list of all the activities I think that, you know, you're probably doing over the course of the week. You know, would you write down how many hours you're spending on doing each of these? And then what you need to do is you need to roll up the number of hours and, and multiply that out. Ultimately, you're trying to elicit the time allocations for each individual for each role and then multiply that by individual's salaries. And then salaries is, off, is also kind of weird because, you know, salaries, you know, you, you would think about how much somebody makes in a year, but there's also this weird thing called fringe. And fringe just means the extra money that's in addition to salary being paid for, say, health insurance or other benefits that people receive. And oftentimes, people don't exactly know what that is. And so you have to try to figure that out. But, you know, a ballpark estimate is usually it's, you know, 20% of whatever people's salaries are. So stepping back, I want to give a, a brief example. So let's say that you're delivering uh, an early childhood intervention to infants in some rural area, and you're using community health workers uh, to do that. Community health workers are traveling to homes and they're meeting with moms and their babies. And so to figure out what's the cost of the community health workers time, you meet up with three of them and you find out that they work 40 hours a week and that they're spending about 20 of those hours on the project doing clinical activities. So in other words, about 50% of their time. And then if you also know that they're paid say $20 an hour, you can do some simple math and say, well, you know, 20 hours a week, times $20 per hour is going to be about $400 per CHW per week. And then you can do out some math. So if you know you have 10 or 20 CHWs that are doing this over the course of six months, you could just do out the multiplication for the cost per week and come out with your final numbers. All right. So, so that's staff at like a really, right. That's like a 5,000 foot view. It's really not getting in, into the weeds in a super great level of granularity, but you get a sense of like what needs to go into it to start doing a cost analysis. The other bucket that I wanted to highlight to show some of the nuances is this space bucket. And that one's tricky because it involves this, this thing called overhead. And overhead just means things that you can't directly attribute to the program that you're studying. So that might be, for example, electricity in a building, janitorial services for cleaning, right? There's, there's sort of like common things that are happening that you can't just be like, oh, well, that's like, pills being given for these people who have a need or something like that. It's just general. And so for space, you'd want to um, do something quite similar to what I was describing before to come out with what the overhead costs look like um, in terms of allocating a, a percentage of space for the, uh, the program that's being used. So for an example here, you know, let's say that for this early child development program, your headquarters for doing this is inside of some local church or something like that. And you're just in a small office in the space trying to do your work. The easiest way to cost out the space would be as follows. You'd pull out a measuring tape, figure out what's the square footage of the office that you're in, and then find out what is the square footage of the whole church. And so let's say you do that and you find out that your space is 5% of the total space of the church. You then want to know, well, what's the total overhead for the church? So all the janitorial services, the electricity, et cetera. And let's say it's $1,000 a month. So if you're in 5% of the space, then your cost would be 5% of that $1,000 or $50 per month. 
but you're not really out of the woods yet, right? So that's just sort of the cost of overhead, but you know, there's a cost to like building the church itself. Um, and so you're gonna have a roof over your head, you're gonna have walls, and those also cost something beyond the electricity. And so for that, can you hear me okay? Yes. Oh, great. Okay, good. Um, so I was just gonna say that, so you still wanna know what is the actual cost of the building that you're inside of. And so for that, uh, there are basically a couple of possibilities. So one is maybe you're just paying rent, right? And so if you're paying rent, then the cost of that space is sort of accounted for by the cost of rent. And maybe those utilities that are overhead are already rolled into it. And so that would be like the easiest thing. But in a lot of the work that I do, you know, I'm working in some um, country in a rural area and it's some sort of vacant space that has a value to it, but it's really opaque what it is. And so for that, you need to do this silly thing of figuring out, well, you know, what is the life expectancy of a church and how much did it originally cost to, to build? And so for that, you know, give an example, let's say that, you know, find out the church was built in 1980, cost a million dollars. And then you Google how to adjust for inflation to figure out what a million dollars would be worth today you find out that it would be worth about $3 million today. And then you need to figure out, well, you know, how long would a church last if no one were trying to repair it or take care of it? You know, maybe the church would only survive, let's say about 50 years before the roof collapsed, et cetera. So it has a life expectancy of about 50 years. So you would take the $3 million for the present day value of that church, divide it by the 50 years, and come out with uh, $60,000 per year or $5,000 per month. And again, remember we said you're in 5% of the space. So 5% of that $5,000 per month comes out to be $250. Add that to your overhead, $300 per month, done. So all this is just to say that, you know, none of this really is that hard. It's, it's just tedious. You know, for the staff, you probably have to dig through payroll, figure out salaries, fringe, whatever else. For the space we just discussed, you're, you know, hunting around through old records, trying to figure out bills of electricity and heating. It's all annoying, but it's not that hard to do. And there are ways of trying to set up systems to make it easier for yourself. But I'm going to skip over the, the other couple of buckets. I do want to talk about in the top left-hand corner here, you see these uh, words like capital, recurrent, fixed, variable. Um, I found when I started doing cost analyses, these were more important than I expected in one way and not in another. It wasn't important for like figuring out total cost really, but it was important for like understanding the jargon of talking to other economists who get really dorky and excited about this. And so it's important to know like what some of these terms mean. And so I'm going to provide some, some really quick definitions here. Um, Cause when you figure out what your costs are, you really want to break it down by, for example, capital and recurrent. So, you know, capital is just a one-time expenditure. It's like what you pay upfront for something. So, you know, maybe at the outset of a program, you bought a car or you bought a computer or an x-ray machine or whatever. So that would be a capital cost. A recurrent cost is something you're paying on a regular basis every month. So that could be like rent, for example, or a monthly telephone bill, et cetera. So that's just capital versus recurrent when people say that. The next is fixed versus variable. And this is one that I trip up on sometimes as well, but basically fixed costs are those that they don't fluctuate regardless of the volume of activities that you're doing. So, you know, if you're doing a lot more work or a lot less work, like your rent is going to cost the same. And so, you know, unless you move to a bigger space, but rents, you know, generally would be considered a fixed cost. If you have people who have a salary, you know, even if they're going crazy working 80 hours a week or they're only working 10 hours a week, that's also a fixed cost of sorts. But then you also have variable costs, right? So if you're doing more activities, you're probably going to have more printing costs, more shipping costs, et cetera. And so you can parse it out that way. And the last two are important. If you were ever to write, I found out that these were important basically because I was trying to publish an article about a cost analysis that we had done with Teresa in Sierra Leone and realized that people care about um, economic costs and societal costs. So basically financial costs are just the money that is outlaid for doing something. You know, like what cost did Teresa spend to implement her intervention, for example. Uh, but economic costs take into account um, donations and in-kind volunteer time and the like. So, you know, if, for example, the Global Fund gives a bunch of medicines for HIV, 
you know, you don't, you know, for, from a programmatic perspective, the financial costs are zero, but the economic costs are actually quite large because, you know, the global fund could be subsidizing those medicines to the tune of, you know, $10 million or something. Um, and then the other bit is societal versus payer perspective. So the payer perspective is what the costs are from the perspective of whoever is implementing. So it could be a hospital or health facility or, or some, you know, organization that I founded or something. A societal perspective takes into the cost, takes into account the cost of the patients. So there are opportunity costs that end up happening. So, you know, in the ECD example, for example, um, you know, maybe uh, moms who are receiving visits from these community health workers, they're losing two hours of work every week because they're meeting to learn about early childhood development and doing exercises and whatnot. And so there's a lost cost that's happening there or lost, um, you know, revenues that could have been generated by the mom if, if she were working or something like that. And so you also need to um, take that into account if, if you're going to do a societal perspective. And that's necessary for most journals like, you know, GMA, for example, Journal of American Medical Association requires you to have a societal perspective or they'll reject, they'll send it back to you and say, you need to fix this. Um, the last couple of bits here. So one is that everything that I've been talking about so far uh, is always relative to some unit of time. Um, so it's really important to remember that when you're talking about costs, it's always cost per unit of time typically. Um, as, a, as a frame of reference. And that's important to know because these costs could expand or contract over time, right? So in the early childhood development example, maybe the first couple of months that you're implementing, uh, CHWs are like just starting out being trained or they're just starting to go into the communities and figure out what's happening. So the amount of time that they're actually expending could be quite small. Um, and so the costs could, could vary as a function of that. And then when things are sort of going, you know, full fledged, there could be a lot more activities and a lot more costs associated with it. And so to take into account something like that, you might want to have, you know, a survey that's given to the CHWs each month to say over the course of the past month, how much time have you been allocating? And then the next month and then the next month. And so there may be some sort of a tracking element that's involved in this. You can't necessarily always do it completely retrospective, or you may be missing some level of granularity. And then the last bit is what I've mentioned uh, here, just the word counterfactual, which is in the case, the example that I've been giving, it's just ECD care versus no ECD care. Like either it's happening or it's not happening. And so the you know, comparative cost would just be zero. But oftentimes you're comparing one intervention to another, in which case, uh, you know, unfortunately, often you'd, you'd need to cost both of those things to figure out what the difference uh, looks like. So in this next slide here, um, this is just a broken down example of a cost analysis that I did recently on an HIV program that Partners in Health was implementing in part of uh, Malawi. <clears throat> so you can see in the top left, I'm listing out what our recurrent costs are, and then I'm breaking those down by human resources, medicines, transportation, et cetera, and then capital costs, like we bought a vehicle, we had a space built. This is just sort of a layout to show you what it looks like um, each column is also where those costs were coming from. So Partners in Health, you know, paid the majority of it, but then you had the Global Fund, Ministry of Health, and the District Commissioner also paying into it. And you can see, as I mentioned before, if you look at the Global Fund, you know, they paid a ton for antiretrovirals. They, they pay, you know, in a year, almost $800,000. Um, and then at the bottom, you can see I have a, a, a citation here. So I'm going to cite myself a few times, and it's not because I'm self-important. It's, it's because I'm familiar with my work, and I'm not always familiar with other people's work. Um, and so you know, if you look up any of these, and you're like, gee, you know, how did Ryan do this analysis? And you take a peek at it, you can always reach out to me, and I can talk you through some of it, or I could send you some templates or whatever if, if you wanted to try to institute some of this yourself. And then this last bit here is, um, you know, I'm actually I'm talking from... DC right now because I, I'm presenting on a framework called time-driven activity-based costing, which the Global Fund in USAID and others in the Gates Foundation are really quite interested in. Um, and it's a slightly different framework for thinking about um, the typical way that I've described costing so far. So a lot of um, costing is just sort of figuring out what all of your individual expenditures are, 
and then adding that up and coming out with a total cost. A, a different way of going about it, which is you know slightly more fun and qualitative actually, is to shadow patients as they're going through a facility or as they're receiving care. So you're figuring out you know, where are they going over the course of care, who are they seeing, and then how much time is being allocated to them. And the way that you get costs here is basically you can break everything down to sort of a per minute cost. So, you know, if we know that a nurse, for example, is working, you know, um, 100,000 minutes per year, right? If we know they work 40 hours a week, you do add some multiplication, say it comes out to be 100,000, and their salary is $30,000, then you know that their cost per minute would be um, 30 cents per, per minute. And so for something like, um, measuring vital signs, for example, which might take five minutes, that would be a dollar fifty worth of allocated costs. And so this diagram that you can see in the top right hand corner is an example of one of those process maps for antenatal care at one of our facilities in Haiti, where we were basically just shadowing patients to see, you know, where they were going, who they were seeing, and then attributing costs to that. I'm not going to get into any of the details here. There are a couple citations that I've listed, which are methods articles that I've recently published. And you can take a peek at those if you wanted to try to understand this. It's sort of a gold standard. And there are a lot of organizations, you know, like those that I'm here in DC talking with today that are interested in, in moving this direction. All right, so uh, costs are over. I think we can feel good about that. It's behind us, um, you know, keeping in mind, like it's annoying, but it's not that hard. If anybody's interested in trying to do cost analysis, you can always email me. I can send you templates. Happy to hop on the phone for 15 to 30 minutes, talk about a, a program you're interested in, questions you might have. Um, but I wanted to shift now to actually like linking costs to outcomes because ultimately, you know, that's what's really going to spur a lot of conversations with folks. And so the first bit that I have here is on cost effectiveness analysis. And so Cost effectiveness analysis is really just looking at your costs per outcome. So that might be an outcome like the number of deaths that have been reduced or the number of car accidents that have been averted or the number of heart attacks that have been prevented. I mean, any of these basically could be an outcome. And remember, we're talking about this from a utilitarianism perspective, right? So we want to maximize the number of our outcomes, assuming they're good outcomes, um, in a way that, you know, with a limited budget, we want to maximize those outcomes, irrespective of how those benefits are allocated or whom they're going to. We just want the most of those based on what our budget ends up looking like. So I keep that in mind. So the most important thing for cost effectiveness analysis is this thing called an ICER. Um, uh, jargony title, incremental cost effectiveness ratio. So all this really is, is your relative costs for two or more interventions to your relative effectiveness. And so, you know, the equation here is literally just, you know, what's your cost for your intervention minus the cost for whatever your comparator is, and then dividing that by the effectiveness for your intervention minus the effectiveness for whatever your comparator is. And so I have a little example here, um, which shouldn't take too, you know, too long to go through. So, you know, let's say you're trying to, you know, prevent heart attacks, for example. And, um, you know, we find that exercise costs people, you know, $10 per month. And over a course of about a year, it lowers blood pressure by, by 10 units over that period of time. And then statin drugs cost $50 per month, so it's more expensive but it also lowers blood pressure more. It lowers it by 30 units over the same time period. So the question then might be, well, what is our one year ICER incremental cost effectiveness ratio for a statin drug compared to the referent case of exercise? And so, so your, your cost one here, the sort of intervention, which is the statin drug, we said is uh, $50 a month. So over a year, it's just 50 times 12, it's 600 bucks per person versus exercise is $10 per month, so over a year is $120. So that gives you your C1 and your C0. And then the, the effectiveness we already have in the time period they're interested in. So that would just be 30 units over a period of 12 months for the case of the statin drug or 
10 units over the course of 12 months for exercise. And so then you just do the math, right? So 600 minus 120 is 480 divided by 30 minus 10 is 20. And what you come out with is that the costs, the additive cost of um, one additional unit of improved systolic blood pressure is $24 per unit over and above the exercise um, comparison, right? So, so that's great because now we're relating, you know, money to outcomes. And then the question becomes like, well, like is $24 per unit uh good like do is do we want to care about that and get excited about it and publish it somewhere and then it like changes healthcare or is that like a bad number and nobody cares about it and then you move on to the next thing and so to figure that out in most industries including the health insurance industry has what are called willingness to pay thresholds and so a health insurance company might say for example gee you know $24 per unit of systolic blood pressure like that's the good investment on our part. Like we will pay for whatever that intervention is because if I lower your blood pressure, we're not gonna have to pay for you if you have cardiac arrest or something like that, right? Like you might not have a heart attack, so it's worth us to save money by paying for this intervention. On the other hand, you know, if it were say um, $10,000 per unit saved, an insurance company might say, no, nah, not worth it. Like maybe you'll have a heart attack unfortunate for you, but like, we're not going to cover that. Right. Um, which was kind of, I don't know if, um, some of you watched fight club like way back when, but mm -hmm. like, you know, that was like the role of like the main protagonist in fight club is to figure out like, should we fix cars so they don't crash? Like it depends on how often they crash and how much we get sued. It's the same sort of arithmetic that's going on here of figuring out like, what is the willingness to pay threshold? And so that's what's reflected in this figure in the bottom left-hand corner here. Um, so oftentimes you'll find that it, um, most new interventions fall in this top right hand quadrant. So, so just to talk about the X and Y axis first, actually, I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself. So the X axis as you're moving from left to right is the effectiveness of an intervention. And as you're moving along the Y axis upwards, it's more costly. And notice that it says cost difference or effect difference. So in this case, what we'd want to imagine is that the exercise, which is our comparison case, is plotted right in the middle of the x, y axis, right? It's, it's like right where those lines intersect. And everything else is plotted on this map relative to exercise at x equals zero, y equals zero. And so in the case of what we just discussed, you know, we find that the statin drug is both more effective, but it's also more expensive and so it lands us in quadrant one and maybe we want to fund that maybe we don't it could also be the case that it's less effective but it's more costly right it lands in quadrant two you definitely don't want to do that right you don't want something that's less effective but costs more money so you can rule that out altogether it could also land in quadrant three which is an interesting one right so maybe an intervention is less effective but it's also less costly relative to the base case and then you want to talk about it some more. And then the last area that you could fall into quadrant four is maybe something is, you know, this is like the miracle drug, right? Like it is more effective and it is less costly. And in which case, like there's no conversation to be had, like it's better, we're going to do it. So the interesting cases are if they land in quadrant one or quadrant three, and most of the time it's going to land in quadrant in one, because if you're doing something new, it's probably going to have more of an effect. It's just going to cost more. So I might pause for a second here and see, does anybody have any questions about cost effectiveness analysis as I've described it a little bit here? <laughs> All right, I'm gonna take <laughs> Does somebody want to chime in or should I move on? I think you can move on. Okay, sounds great. <clears throat> so let's move on to cost utility analysis. Um, I got confused for a while, like what's the difference between cost effectiveness, cost utility analysis? You know, honestly, there's so many acronyms, it's super easy to get lost and you may already be at this point and that's totally fine. Um, 
But you know, cost utility analysis is actually just like um, a form of cost effectiveness analysis. It's like one uh, type of cost effectiveness analysis. And it's where the effectiveness piece of it um, is looking at utilities. You can think about utilities as just, um, so like let's say you're in perfect health, like you're awesome, like you can run marathons and everything, like you're a one in that case, like perfect health, that equals one. And if you are dead, then that's a zero. Like there's no utility in being dead. And so zero, right? And most people are like somewhere on the spectrum from like perfect health to death. Um, and so, you know, maybe you have uh, pneumonia for a couple of months, like I've had, unfortunately, in which case, like, you're like a 0.7, or, you know, you have depression, and it's episodic. And so sometimes you're a 0.9, and sometimes you're a 0.6. Um, but there's this sort of variation over time. So <clears throat> economists have gotten kind of fancy about utilities. And they're interested in two specific forms that I'm listing here. So one is, and maybe Teresa talked about some of this, but one is a, a dolly or disability adjusted life year. And the other is a quality or quality adjusted life year. And to be honest, for the most part, just to simplify, like quality is just the inverse of a dolly. Like you want to av avoid dollies because they're like disability adjusted life years. And you want to have as many quality adjusted life years as possible. So it's just looking at it kind of the flip side. But I wanted to give you a, a dolly example because basically what a dolly does is it measures the overall disease burden, uh, inclusive of ill health, disability, and early death, <clears throat> which is really powerful because you're accounting for both morbidity, you know, if you're sick, and you're also accounting for mortality if you die. So, so let's take the example in the bottom right-hand corner here. So <clears throat> you're a baby, you're born, uh, and you're a healthy baby, right? So you get a one, like you start out at a one, and you're living a healthy life up until you hit this first little orange patch that you see sticking out. So at that point, like you have some disability that happens, um, but you recover and then you hit another patch. Like, you know, let's say you, you have a, a hip replacement or something and you're disabled for a little bit of time. And then finally you get to a point of like old age or senescence where like you're not doing well, you're in a wheelchair, like your cognitive faculties aren't as great. And so, you're living your final years in this red zone where maybe you're at like a 0.7 out of, of one or something like that. And then finally you die. And so that's the death line, right? But it's not over there because, you know, maybe if you had spent your whole life going to the gym every day, like you wouldn't have died at that point, you would have died later. And so you want to also take into account premature death. And the way that that's often done is uh, they actually figure out like, well, like what's the healthiest country that lives the longest and it's almost always Japan. So they like look to Japan and figure out, well, what's the life expectancy in Japan? And you know, if you die earlier than whatever that is, that's sort of the reference point. Um, so <clears throat> I want to give uh, an example of how this actually plays out. Cause it, it seems a little bit opaque until you actually apply it. So let's talk through this example here of doing a cost utility analysis. Um, so let's say there's a new form of insulin for diabetes that's being given and it costs $1,000 per patient per year, whereas standardized insulin costs $200 per year. And so you follow a cohort of people over a period of time. Some of them got the new drug, some of them got the original. Um, and everybody, when they start out, just to make it easy, they're 70 years old. So over the next 10 years, what you find is that the average person with a new drug, they live to be 80 years old and they're pretty healthy. They're at a utility level of 0.9. And then somebody who's in the control group, um, you know, they don't live as long. They die at 75, so they die earlier. And they're also in a state of worse health um, of, of 0.8. So again, we're in a situation where the new drug is gonna cost more money, but people live longer and they live at a higher level of health. And so, you know, the question is, is it worth it? And so the cost side of it is just the same as we described before. So we're looking over 10 years. For the new drug, it's just $1,000 a year times 10 years is 10,000 bucks. And for the, the people who got the old drug, it's $200, not times 10 years, but times five because they died. And so, 
you know, death is free in a sense. You're not allocating any money to people who have already died. And so it's just $200 per year times the five years that they're alive is, is $1,000. So 10,000 minus 1,000 is a $9,000 difference over that 10-year period in the new drug versus the old drug. And then you get into the, the quackery of the quality adjusted life you're here. So let's start with the, <clears throat> the um, old drug, just to make it a little bit simpler. So people live for an average of five years. So you started at 70 to 75. So that's five years, so five. And then over that time, they have an average utility of 0.8. And so five times 0.8 is just four. Um, they also had five years where they were dead, and so their utility there was zero, so they're contributing nothing. So you just end up with five quality adjusted life years. Compare that to the, the group that got the new drug. They lived all 10 years at a utility of 0.9, and so 0.9 times 10 is, is nine. And so the difference in quality adjusted life years between the two groups would just be nine qualities minus four qualities equals five qualities. And you divide that by your difference in cost, which is, or you have the $9,000, which is the difference in cost, and divide that by the difference in quality just of life years. And to die, you end up with $1,800 per quality gained. So why do people care about um, qualities as opposed to just regular cost effectiveness analysis? And the answer is, um, you know, what happens if, um, you know, a minister of health, for example, comes to you and says, you know, should I be paying, um, you know, $1,000 per heart attack avoided or $10,000 per case of depression avoided? You know, it's like kind of like comparing apples to oranges and so people get confused. But if you can convert depression to quality adjusted life years, it's an example of something that has a high level of morbidity but a low level of mortality associated with it. And compare that to something like a heart attack where you know, you, you feel fine and all of a sudden you have a heart attack and you die. So it's sort of low level of morbidity, but a high level of mortality. If you can convert both of those to quality adjusted life years, then now you're comparing apples to apples and you're saying, would you rather pay $1,000 per quality adjusted life year to address depression or $1,500 per quality to address ischemic heart disease or something of the like? And so that's the, the cost utility bit. And now I'm going to skip over a bunch of slides because I'm realizing I'm going to come up to the hour mark pretty quickly here. But I want to get to cost benefit analysis because this is the most like, this is the sketchiest. Like, I, I don't always feel comfortable doing cost benefit analysis. I've done it a couple of times. Um, cost benefit analysis is basically dollars in versus dollars out. And that's really powerful because now you're not just comparing, um, you know, depression to a heart attack or something like that, but you're comparing, a uh, heart attack to uh, educational sessions or something like that, because you're looking basically at return on investment. How much money am I putting in and how much money am I getting out? And so to do that, you actually need to come up with what is the value of a statistical life? Like how much is a life worth? Um, and that's why it's sketchy, as I said. And basically uh, what's unfolded here is that, um, different departments like Environmental Protection Agency, like you wouldn't know it on the surface, but they've actually like come up with estimates. And so the quotation that I have here is a way of getting at it, uh, of sort of soliciting what people's value for life actually is. Like if I gave you a hundred bucks to assume the risk of a one in 100,000 chance of dying, would you take the hundred bucks or not? And you can work with people to figure out like to what extent are people willing to take on risks? Um, obviously, like the the easiest case here is to be like, well, you can't put a value on health, and so you know, go away. But like in reality, like this actually plays out in our day to day lives. Like a lot of you, or some of you, may have like driven to get to uh, class today, um, and you might not have obeyed the speed limit. Like maybe the speed limit was fifty five, but you went sixty five. But like in doing that you assumed a certain risk. Like you knew, knew like, well, if I drive 150 miles an hour, I'm going to like, the car is going to go off and I'm going to die. So that's stupid. I'm not going to do it. It's a really high risk. It's not worth it to you. You're also not going to drive five miles an hour because if you drove five miles an hour, it'd take you forever. 
And maybe it's a lot safer, but it's just not worth the time for you. And so <clears throat> in choosing what, uh, what uh, uh, sort of rate we drive, we're implicitly placing a value on our own lives in terms of, um, of, of what we're, our decisions are that we're So to, to end, um, you know, I wanted to give a, a quick e example here, which is, you know, let's say that we end up deciding that um, the value of a human life based on some of this um, fuzzy math is worth $10 million. And therefore, if somebody lived to 100 years, a quality adjusted life here would be worth $100. So we just said for a diabetes intervention, you know, that was $1,800 per quality gained. And so from a cost benefit analysis perspective, you know, the input is $1,800 and the output is a $100,000 return, which would be, um, you know, one, every $1 invested leads to a $55 return. So that's how you get to a sort of a return on investment framework. Um, and there are other ways of, of going about this, but, you know, $1 in to $55 out sounds amazing, but... Uh, it really depends on whether you're looking at it from a competing risk perspective or um, sort of a, um, a supermarket spree, a shopping spree perspective, because a competing, um, a competing perspective ends up being, well, you can only choose one or the other. So with a toilet paper image here, like it's either going to be A or it's going to be B, and hopefully you pick A, right? So for the diabetes example, like either you're going to give the new drug or you're going to give the old drug, end of case. But what often happens with ministries of health is they have a limited budget and so they can only fund themselves up to a certain point. So even if the incremental cost effectiveness ratio looks great for a particular thing, <coughs> there's only a certain budget that they can expend. And so you're, you're capped off at that point. Um, I wanted to end with um, a, a quick reflection here, which is a, a personal story and then allow um, a couple minutes for, for feedback here, which is a couple of years ago, I was down in Haiti and I was presenting a cost benefit analysis on uh, vaccinations for H HPV vaccine, basically to prevent cervical cancer. I was super excited about it because of what I had found was uh, basically vaccinating people is super cheap and it can prevent, so if, if girls aren't vaccinated, there's like a one in 50 chance, like one in 50 girls are going to get cervical cancer. So like vaccinate them, like almost a no brainer. But I was going up against people in the agriculture department, the education department, infrastructure to argue like, what is the best return on investment? So I'm presenting my case, right? I'm literally presenting it to like the health uh, minister, the finance minister, and all these other people on the panel. I'm talking about how great it is. Somebody's hand goes up and it's this like, old white dude who doesn't fit in with the rest of like the Haitians that are like sitting there. And he says to me, well, is that the subsidized cost of the vaccination or is that the true costs? And my reply to him is, well, that's the subsidized cost because Gavi, this global alliance pays for most of the vaccine. And his reply to me was, well, you can't always expect that high income countries are going to foot the bill for certain care that's being provided. So, we actually needed to take into account the true cost of it. And I got pretty uh, pissed off, to be honest, and I replied to him in front of everybody. I was like, well, you know, under that logic, we would not be providing antiretroviral to people with HIV in Sub-Saharan Africa. That's like literally what is happening is the Global Fund is subsidizing this. And so like, that is how, like, that's the way that the world works. It makes a lot of sense. I lost the case. And afterwards I was like angry. I was like, who was this jerk? It turns out that the person, uh, his name's Vernon uh, Smith, won the Nobel Prize in economics a couple years ago. Um, and so I mentioned this uh, for a couple of reasons. So one is like, I was in the room, right? Like I was in the room helping the ministry to decide how they should be spending their money, which again is to say like economics and costs matter. People pay attention to them, whether we'd like that to be the case or not. The second point is that a lot of economists are full of crap, right? And so everything that I've said uh, should be taken with a grain of salt because, you know, it's based on this utilitarian sort of framework that can be quite fuzzy math at times. And a lot of it, frankly, is kind of, um, it's BS. And so the best thing to do is to try to do your homework well and then find the people who 
are in positions of power it's to, to make a strong case to them on behalf of the approach that you're using. So, so I'm going to end there. Thank you very much, Ryan. We really enjoyed this session. Thank you. Questions, comments? Questions? Well, I, I don't have a question, but just a comment. Um, I've never looked at projects from an economic point of view, so this was like an opening up of a different perspective for analysis, and yeah, very interesting. Thank you for the session. Yeah, sure, my pleasure. And um, I know, as I said, like this is like a survey at like a five thousand foot view, but you know, like hopefully it makes it sound somewhat interesting to folks. And there are a lot of resources like through my work at Partners in Health, for example, that make it a lot easier if people are like, gee, I want to do this, but I don't know how to start. Like reach out to me and I can easily forward along materials for, for people who might be thinking about it. Thank you. I'm going to turn off the recording right now, uh, but we'll, we'll keep going. Uh, sure.